You are all weirdos. Weird science is the revolution. Weird science is the revolution. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the best new comic show of the week. This is for the week of, I guess it is right now, August 24th, 2024. I'm here, as always, with my man, Gray. What up, Gray? What up, Jim? How are you doing? Are you Genki? Uh, Did I, I ask? Oh, <laughs> Don't no. ask. I feel like crap still. I've been feeling sick for two weeks now. It's getting me all angry. I do want to give a shout out if AL is listening. Thank you for the card. I sent me an e-card. I tried to reply like 10 times. It keeps telling me that I haven't replied, though I may have replied 10 times. And she's probably like, seriously, dude, I get it. <laughs> You're welcome. We you stop replying for God's sake. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> no, that's nice, man. That's nice to hear. Yeah. Even at the beginning, I almost said October. I don't know why I keep almost saying October. Every time I do anything that I mention the date, maybe I think it's the spooky month of October, not Looking summer. To Halloween, James? That what it is? I don't know. I hate Halloween. I can't oh. stand it. But here we are, and we have our best of. And if you've been listening or watching for the last couple of weeks, we have uh, th- slim pickings. Is what I'd say from most of the deal, especially the big two. Well, Gray here is the new sheriff in town, it seems. He's come in and he's picked a ton of books. So we have a ton of books here. What can no I say? It's been a great week. It's weird. Yeah, I you know. actually, and it's yeah. funny, you ended up apologizing because you sent me this list. And I'm like, holy crap, what is this? Uh, and then when I looked at it, I'm like, I actually, every book that I've read that you picked there, I agree. Uh, oh, there's just thank a couple. For that. There's just a couple that I haven't read. Uh, t- one which I do want to read and plan to. I just am not caught up. But we'll get to that. But we do end up, and actually, before we end up even going into the show, I want to stress to everybody, as we do each and every week, if you want to, and please do, tell us what your picks of the week. Just because me and Gray think these are the best books of the week, doesn't mean that you would think they're the best. You might agree with some of them, all of them, whatnot. But you might have some. That we haven't read because we haven't read every single book or even if we read it, if you like it, don't be ashamed or scared to, you know, pick it and put it in because a lot of people when they come to this, including me, I like to see everybody's picks. And if you end up picking something that maybe I thought eh, it was, cool. I might even go back and read an issue I've already read just to see if you end up telling me, especially if you say why. You liked it a little bit of a different view on it. So I'm down with that. Same here. I love to hear that. Yeah, I love to hear people's choices. And yeah, that's a great point, Jim, about getting to reread something. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it it just takes a reread. But with all of the books out, sometimes you just don't have the time. Or when you read something, you just kind of plow through. I mean, I end up doing a bunch of shows. I have to read, you know, eight books for this one, 12 books for that. And sometimes you just have to get done to record it. Uh, but yeah, sometimes when things are mentioned and, and enough mentioned, I'll be like, well, maybe I missed something and go back. But maybe I sit there and say they're crazy, but I won't say that in the comments. I'll let them <laughs> check it. But really, a lot of times there are books that even be, uh, they're brought up that I didn't even know came out and a lot of other people wouldn't or something like that. And I've actually put some books on my pull list because of this show from you, Bray, and some other people suggesting them but as we do we'll start with dc comics gray it says dc is a nil uh, a null set once again i have one book for it and it actually is superman number 17 written by joshua williamson with art by jamal campbell i think the art is really really good and in that it is a absolute power tie-in and i think it's one of the best absolute power tie-ins that we've had and i've mentioned on our podcast that i do with eric shea america's sweetheart that when you get the main books for absolute power, I need to have the in-betweens. And there's a lot of tie-ins and a lot of them aren't hitting. And so by the time I get to the next issue of the main, I'm already kind of burned out. I'm like, oh, it's down. I need something to pick me up. And this kind of did with a story that has Superman and Zatanna going off to the Oblivion bar. It's kind of fun in that way. The art I said is already great. The stuff with Lois and the power suit deal I've seen that a million times before. That's not a wow factor for me. And it's really odd, some of the circumstances in it. But seeing Superman without power still ending up going and being super, I think, is a pretty cool concept. And by the end, I don't want to spoil everything, but by the end, you get a cliffhanger that's actually pretty big for the book itself. It's not exactly a absolute power tie-in type cliffhanger. It's a cliffhanger that's specific to that tie-in. I think that that's something that some of them are missing. I mean, you end up having a tie-in, and then you end up with 
oh, Amanda Waller, this uh, it kind of is like, OK, we, we've had that. But this actually has a pretty cool tie in uh, by the end. Did you read it at all, Gray? I did. I did. I was a little bit lost because I've not been reading all the Absolute Power tie-ins. But yeah, I, I see what you're saying. I love that Zatanna's in it and I love the Oblivion Bar. Nice to yeah, see Yeah, the that. Oblivion Bar is great. You even have a new character, Kid Warlock, and there's kind of a joke that Superman fought him back in Smallville as a kid and then goes to fight Kid Warlock again and goes, hey, uh, you're older now. Are you now Warlock? And he's like, nah, I kind of have a branding. He's still yeah. Kid Warlock. Give me the kid. <laughs> the, the look of this deal. And then you get this bartender that's a dud character. But if you did notice, it looks like when Superman ends up grabbing this Kid Warlock and throwing him across the Oblivion Bar, he kind of does crash into that, that poor bartender, Adam, who just can't catch a break. But it's kind of a, a cool issue. And again, the, the cliffhanger is big in a way that you're going to have to see if Superman and Zatanna end up going over you know, a line that they probably wouldn't go over at points. And one of the things in the whole issue is Superman is a little off. He's a little over the top because John, his son, John. He was angry in this one, Jim. He was really angry. And I like seeing that. And he even waits and he ends up where he says, this is a, he waits till everybody's gone. They're in this whole deal. And he starts punching the wall and he says yeah. to Zatanna, hey, I don't usually do this. And I don't like people seeing it because of who I am, but I am pissed. And he is. Then he calls everybody out in the Oblivion Bar that made me laugh. Also, when they go into the Oblivion Bar, you could just imagine that the record scratch goes where (laughs) the music stops, but they all (laughs) look at him almost like a weird science deal in the movie and stuff like that. Or even like a, uh, uh, what's it called? 48 Hours or something like that. American Wealthy Wealthy London when they walk in that pool. Exactly. I love that. That is one of my favorite tropes ever is when the record scratches and everybody looks over. So that's a cool play. But yeah, that is my only DC. You don't have a DC, so no. Will's finest was close to you, and we talked about that, didn't we? It was close, but I don't know if this felt a little bit like bland, a bit boring. Yeah, I, I say it was supposed to. Yeah, well, it was in that deal in in Mark Wade's World's Finest. It was the first kind of big team up of yeah. the Trinity, and I felt like that deserves more than one issue. Me and too. you ended up having the one issue, and so you have a setup, and then you really and I said to you before we even recorded. Usually have obviously a beginning, middle, end. This felt like the middle was missing, or at least rushed, because you had to get it done for a one shot. And I think that you end up solving a mystery that would have been really cool, but you solve it really quickly just yeah, by showing it. Because, yeah. yeah, you don't have a lot of time. And it, at one point, I thought they were playing the idea that you might think that Wonder Woman is a murderer, and they could have played that out maybe for an issue. That would have been interesting. The next yeah. One. yeah, because at one point Batman says, "Hey, I want to put the lasso on you because you haven't asked yourself." And I thought that would be a cool play, but there wasn't enough time. But it was good for a one shot. And mm. uh, in that, you end up having pretty good. Uh, Gleb Melnikov does the art. He does a really good job. Oh, he on does. Yeah, I didn't even yeah. notice to start with. I, I know. It was down more. I, I said like, the wow. same thing. And then when I looked at it, I even thought that it was kind of a combo of what looked like a Dan Mora and a Greg Capullo combo. Mm. And that's a pretty good combo. But oh, I'm yeah. telling you, I got halfway through before I actually realized, wait a minute, this doesn't exactly look like Dan Moore and checked. I'm like, holy crap. Like, it looked really, really Great cool. job. So uh, that's just a shout out, maybe an audible mention. But we'll move over to Marvel. And you ended up having three books. You're in love with Marvel this week. Two of the books I did read and I did like as well, but I'll let you start off. Well, we're starting with Get Fury. Okay, Get Fury, issue four. It's by Garth Ennis, of course. Um, pencils by Jason Burroughs and inks by Guillermo Ortego. Oh, my God, Jim. Mm-hmm. Did I put yes. you that name? No, I think you did it p- perfect. A, a rare three ninety nine book as well for Marvel, I've got to say that. Um, but uh, can, I, can I shout out Sus Gabe? Sus Gabe gave this a terrible review, and I want to know why. He, he was moaning about it being too much exposition, about being too boring. But I love the story. I love the, like, the character work, you know, with, um, who was it, sorry, Nick Fury's mm, lo- lover from Vietnam. And his uh, lover. Daughter. daughter. I mean, we find out that he's, you know, he's like happy-go-lucky, lay them all, Nick Fury. Look at Nick. What's he been up to? I know, really. And, <laughs> and the funny play is, first off, that daughter, did she uh, uncross her arms once during the whole issue? I mean, she was so <laughs> angry, <laughs> the whole was. issue. And all I'll say is, before I give it back to you, is, her mother is describing the horrors that she has endured yeah. so that her daughter wouldn't. Like, she ends up pretty much being very personal with a lot of people, basically to get her daughter off the hook. Like, they're not going after her daughter because she's, and her daughter's mad. 
And I'm like, you better thank your mom every single day because the people that she had to be with to actually make them save are horrific. So you end up, but uh, one thing too, you get this book, and if you have read Get Fury, what it seems, it's almost like a horror movie where you have to have interesting kills. There is at least one horrific kill every issue, and this one, it was from the butt of the rifle, and it is horrific. It is the worst. I mean, at the end of the series, we might have to talk about which was the worst death. Yeah, most gruesome. Getting your face caved in by the butt of a rifle, that is pretty gruesome, but uh, you keep going and tell us why you like it. Well, it's, uh, I'm, I'm a sucker for Vietnam War stories. I always have been. I used to love the Nam, Marvel's The Nam series back in the day. But yeah, I think Garth Ennis is doing a great job because there are kind of multiple plot lines going on, aren't there plot threads in this? He's kind of bringing them together now. So it's like, whoa, I'm just really into it. And as you say, the violence can be a little bit over the top. But this issue, <laughs> surprisingly, he did kind of pull back on the violence despite. Yeah, except yeah, that one. <laughs> that one it's scene. funny too, at one point you end up having a checkpoint and the lady gets out to show her papers, and she has legit papers. And yeah. and again, it goes into and explains the idea that she is, you know, using some people. And also she has an uncle that's up, and she talks about how they ended up not being killed and able to get where they are. But this guy looks at her papers, and then he's like, I'm going to have to check the car. And in the car is Frank Castle. And he just grabs the guy and pulls him into the car. I'm like, didn't anybody see this then? Just they see his legs are flying into the window. And then they call the other guy over <laughs> and does the same thing. And they're snapping necks and throwing him into the river. I'm like, holy crap. But it's not over-the-top violence with that. But you do see what he does. It's like yeah. Frank Castle has a, a kill list, you know, quite long. In this, he is just ripping apart. This everything. is the original Frank Castle, isn't it? This is the Frank Castle that people have been missing, you know. Yeah, what I mean? and it's it's not pulling back on it. And no. they're trying to get to Nick Fury at the Hanoi Hilton, it's a big deal. And he's already there, and they even allude to that by the end that he's being tortured. But the big play is, you know, trying to get to that. And you have this lady who has, you know, oh, this general, I've been doing this and that. We won't get fully graphic with it, but she's kind of doing some things with this guy. And Ooh. I love the fact that they, they end up getting to this guy and they, they're killing people along the way to get to this guy. And it looks like the guy and a bunch of his guys are, are having a, a, you know, a dance party. They're playing the records and stuff. <laughs> and I would assume maybe it's the Beatles, but in that there is no way that turning up a stereo is going to get a, a, a machine gun. To not make noise, but still, uh, it, it's pretty crazy. But you, you go for the for the end of it because well, I do think it's pretty good. Yeah, Jim, only two more issues as well. It's a six issue mini, so you know it's, it's going to be wrapping up soon. I just can't wait to see how it finishes, how it ties it all up because people have been complaining it's a little bit complicated with the, the CIA involvement, you know that kind of thing. But I'm really into it. So it feels like a really really good movie or a series. Oh it's, yeah, yeah, and in in this issue too, the CIA actually seems to even realize that yeah, the, the, we're not teaming up with the, the yeah, greatest exactly. guys and things like that. And the whole idea of who wants Frank dead, who wants Nick Fury dead, and pretty much they want Nick Fury dead because he knows too much and he's been. They think he's been compromised, but he, you know, Nick Fury can hold out. Uh, but again, at the end, you don't see it, but you end up seeing that he's in the Hanoi Hilton, and they mm. say that yeah, there's trouble, but he can probably withstand it. So we'll have to see if Frank gets there in time. I think he will, and I think those two will skedaddle out. I actually really just want to see what what Nick Fury does when he's confronted by having a daughter. I, I wonder how he's going to react to it because they I know, think they, same they even say they probably forgot about us. He probably, I don't know. Garth Ennis is crazy, though. You don't know how he'll play it. He may have Nick Fury just like, I don't know, I've laid a lot of ladies. Like, he could do that. But <laughs> I, I'm hoping that he kind of remembers or at least lies. But uh, with that, we'll go to your next pick, which is something I didn't read. So I'll shut my mouth and you go with it. Well, this is a surprise for me as well because I didn't expect to enjoy it so much. I did. I read issue one. It thought it was okay. But this is Phoenix, issue two, written by Stephanie Phillips. Art by Alessandro Miracolo, a little bit controversial there. Three ninety nine, so it's a, it's a good one. But Jim, if you like cosmic Marvel, if you like the cosmic stories, I think you might enjoy this. And if you like Corsair, who I don't really know, kind of a Han Solo character in this, he's in it, and he's hilarious. He's he's what made me enjoy it so much. That's pretty cool. I don't know the character very well, but it's made me want to, you know, like kind of do a bit of a dive into his uh, his Star Jammers backstories and see see what it's all about. Yeah, I've only read a couple of things with the Star Jammers, and they were yeah. kind of cool. The things I've read, but not a ton. And, and as you said, Alessandro Miracolo, 
there was things of him ripping off art and tracing other people's Maybe art. Tracing, I, did, yeah. I didn't I didn't see anything this week. I didn't see anything of somebody saying, Oh, this panel and this panel. and you know that people are going through this now oh, yeah, to doubt. really see. So it, it may come out or may have, you know, even today that I didn't see. Uh but as far as I could tell, it looked like he's free and clear at least this week. But still, it still doesn't take away the cra- and if you have seen it, it's very obvious, uh, last issue. And also Stealing like some very very popular artists and popular scenes. I know why right? that was a big really problem, crazy. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, that's crazy. But yeah, I, I actually was told by a bunch of people to read this issue, but it's like I will still do. I'm not listening to you because Stephanie Phillips has been a real jerk to me. But oh, even no. so, really? yeah, she ended up. Well, she was you? mad at. She wanted me to fire Sus Gabe at one point. Oh my god! And then I'm like, I'm not going to fire. Why well, am I going to fire Sus Gabe for his Get Fury review? Well, that's true. <laughs> and it's like she's like, like, how can you fire a guy who's not being paid or anything? I mean, <laughs> is it a firing or is he just walking away? But uh, yeah, that was a big because Gabe ended up reviewing her Harley Quinn, and in it, I get it. If you say in a review that the person, the writer, didn't care. Or didn't try, they might have a bit of offense to that. And and really though, when yeah. they have an offense and they say, "Well, I did try," then you just come back. If I'm Gabe, I'm saying, "Well, then you really suck." If you're really trying and it's that bad, like maybe I'm giving you a hook out of it. But uh, yeah, she was mad. And then a lot of people came out of the woodwork and just bad mouthed me, and I was pissed. And some people who, like always acted like they were friends. I saw and I remember. There's one guy. Uh, punch him if I ever see him. I'm not gonna, you know, Jim say violence forgets. is the answer. <laughs> oh, I, like, I'm telling like I, an elephant. <laughs> how bad this is is that this guy tweeted out stuff. I will every three or four months uh, go and retweet that tweet just so he knows that I remember. I have the tweet in a uh, uh, what's it called a doc, you know, a Google oh doc God. where I have all these things there in my hit list. Jim, you need to take a chill pill about the sound of it, man. Listen to some Beatles. I think that's why I'm always sick. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people did tell me that Phoenix number two I think, was pretty um, I've seen some good comments, people saying it, this it kind of slowed down the pace in this issue, so it, it works a lot better because the first issue was a little bit like, whoa, you know, there's a lot going on here. That's what I found. But yeah, it's good focus on Jean and Corsa. And Stephanie Phillips, she's not my favorite, but she can do some things decent enough. I wouldn't say she's the worst writer. Uh, but again, I think that she's very hit or miss. So if this yeah. is good, uh, I should check it out. We'll see. But we'll move on to the next book, which I think will be on most people's list. Uh, what is that? Okay, we're talking about Ultimate Spider-Man, issue eight. Can you believe it? Issue eight now, written by Jonathan Hickman. Um, it's got art by Marco Ticetto. Thank goodness, because he's killing it when he's on these issues. Jim, four ninety nine for these Ultimate titles. So a little bit pricey, but I don't know. What do you think? Is it is it worth it? Well, here's this weird thing. I it, We talked about this. I have a review for it. I haven't put it up yet, but we ended up talking about it on our Marvel podcast. And uh, my man, Matt, Dr. Matt, he does not like Marco Cicchetto's art, and I don't get it. I've, no I've actually talked to two people this week that don't like Marco Cicchetto's okay. art, and I don't get it. I really like it. Now, one of them did say, and it was Wes, who said, he likes the art when it actually is superhero art, not normal. Per- and there's not a ton of Spider-Man, ah, okay. again, in no, this. No, it's a slowdown but, issue, this, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. you do. And, and in this, though, at least you get some of the family. Yeah, it's a birthday party, but it was okay. Jay Jonah was weird in this. Like, he was too <laughs> over the top, but it was kind of goofy. But in this, you do have Tony, who has come back. We had the last issue's cliffhanger. And told Spider-Man, hey, I'm glad you kind of made it. Because remember, most of the people that he tried to get back into being superheroes ended up dying or not accepting it. So he's really, they don't have a lot of numbers. But Mm -hmm. he says, hey, the maker had this list I got a hold of. And you were on top, Spider-Man. You were number one. This is the thing that gets me. Tony is a smart guy. He's there. He even talks a bit to Harry. Harry's in the Goblin deal. And it is kind of him grabbing it, finding it because he bought the whole deal with Stain Stark. Well, Tony kind of gets a little offended by it, but you, you need people. You need numbers. So Harry says, hey, what was I on the list? Please, t- why? Please, Tony, just say, <laughs> oh, you're somewhere on there. I don't know the number. Do some. Oh, yeah, you're there. I can't remember. You're like, hey, there's some. He says, and he pushes it in and digs in. It's like, you weren't on the list. Not at all. And I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you doing? And then just zips off and goes through a push. I'm like, why are you pissing him off? Why are you doing that? And it's just ridiculous. I was so mad. But in that, it does set up that Harry is pretty pissed off. 
pretty upset. Also, there was the thing at the beginning where a lot of people, including myself, were saying that you kind of have that Venom symbiote. Is that, you know, picto tech, whatever it is, where it's the AI of himself and things like that, that does really feel like a symbiote, like a Venom type thing, or at least a black suit uh, kind of place. So we'll have to see. What's I going thought that on was cool. That. I really got into that that beginning part where he's talking to the you know the black ball. Exactly, and it, it's a, a issue that has like a three part. You end up having yeah. the stuff with Tony coming in talking about the list. Then you get the birthday party for a big part. It's okay, you know. You have that little deal. It was nice for character moments, wasn't it, Jim? For people who enjoy you know the Peter Parker extended family, that was nice. And then at the end, I I also thought it was funny he didn't invite Harry. To the, to the party oh, right, but, yeah. and, and they've kind of been friends now But uh, then they have like Almost felt like a backup when you get to the villain It almost felt like that was like This, this is my favorite boom. part Jim And that was part. the part that I think most people will, will watch. That's why they would have picked the book As a best of the week because of that villain part with a Sinister Six that's King kind of a little like Lieutenants being set up, we're getting Leo yeah, Their stories aren't we? Yeah As you say Sinister Six it's going to be exciting Well it already is yeah, and, and they end up going by the five boroughs of Brooklyn, or five boroughs in New York, not Brooklyn. Mysterio, I think, is the Brooklyn leader, which is weird. I, I If I lived in Brooklyn, I wouldn't go with Mysterio. But the idea that there's a six borough, it's kind of clever having the underground and having Mole Man there. Not typically a Spider-Man villain, but we're in the ultimate deal. Mole so Man I, was I freaking was me out cool. when I saw him. about you? It's like, Whoa. The only thing that got me, <laughs> again, Mysterio, we usually get. And Craven, I, I'm kind of craven out. I, I kind of wish that Craven wasn't involved. And the idea that Craven is running a borough of New York just doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like something he would do. But he's there mainly because you want to get that hunt at the end. And that's what Kingpin says, because he is fully aware we know. You know, you had Spidey. And Goblin, they broke in and kind of threatened them, and he's setting out the deal of we're going to go kill them. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what's going down with that. But what do you cool. think of um, Jim actually about Black Cat in this universe? You know, the Walter Hardy. He's kind of a bit, a bit weird, but he's, he's got a great line later on with Mysterio. He's like, Mysterio, yes? Have you gotten <laughs> shorter since our last meeting? <laughs> and it's, it's weird because it looks like in that, it, it didn't play out art-wise because it looked like Mysterio then made himself get bigger. But yeah. it didn't really play out as much in, in the thing. He's like, no, what are you talking no, about? That was pretty tip funny. Toes, maybe. And people were yelling about that, that, oh, my God. But you do see what probably Felicia, because they say his daughter, she looks a little different in that, but pretty cool. Yeah. So we'll see how that plays out. And maybe, you know, later on she'll have something to do with it. I actually said if you look at the – when they get to the table at the birthday party, I swear to God, I went down the deal and I'm like, okay, there's Reary. There's Carol Danvers, there's Miles, because all these kids look like little versions of the DC or the Marvel characters, but I, I, I would doubt that it was. Yeah. But I, I, I had some fun with that, even though at that point, May has crazy eyes. She, her eyes are like, <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I'm like, that. what is going on really? with May? It looks like she's just excited for the presents and things. And just to point out, it is a dual birthday party for Richard and May, and J. Jonah only brought in. <laughs> Present for Richard's kind of trick. Also, when Peter was talking about Jay Jonah, he was kind of really cold about Jay Jonah. Like, why'd you invite this guy? And you have that play, a kind of a joke where Ben thinks that Jay Jonah's, you know, sad and lonely, but Jay Jonah thinks that Ben is, so they're kind of hanging. How funny was cool. it when he, um, the present he gives to Richard, it's like his, his biography, isn't it? Like Jay Jonah's book. But Richard was really nice about it. Oh, he yeah, was like, Richard oh, fine, seemed yeah. excited. The idea, you know, that there is a story nice in it. That has like 8,000 of those books that didn't sell. But yeah, yeah, I, I <laughs> definitely put that on my list as well. And I think most people will. It's one of the favorites of the Ultimate Universe. Though, I will say, these books have to pick up the pace, all of them, including this Ultimate Spider-Man, which it yeah, seems like by true. the end it will. Because you end up having villains now. At least it has a set. There's the villains, Fisk and his guys, versus Peter and Harry. Some of these others, like... Ultimates just, just seems random, out of nowhere fights and things like that. I know. I I'm X Men. Sure I do Ultimates, like the yeah. Ultimate X Men, but you need Me to too. get going with it. You need to get something going. And the thing with Black Panther, Black Panther is just kind of boring overall. It's just too normal in my mind. But we'll we'll see how it goes. And people disagree and whatnot. Ultimates though, oh yeah, yeah. People were arguing with me about how that was. I cannot stand that book. I hope that gets better. People were saying it was like great, it. the last issue with the, the, you know, the new She-Hulk version, but I didn't like it at all. Yeah, that's Sorry. the thing. I yeah. think what people are crazy That's what I think. But <laughs> we will go to the uh, 
Next deal, we'll go to indie uh, books, and this is where, Gray, you're going to shine. You have a bunch of them. Hit it with what your first pick is. Should we go with Dark Horse first? Yeah, is that we'll okay? go with that. Okay. Well, it's Mark Miller. He's here again with Nightclub 2, issue 1. It's volume 2 of Nightclub, art by Juan and Ramirez, published by Dark Horse, of course. Four ninety nine now, so there's been quite a bit of talk about that, Jim, because famously the, the first series was one ninety nine. Mark Miller was taking a loss on those, but he's like, you know, I want to try and get people reading comics and so yeah, what do you think for the jump from one ninety nine <laughs> like, to four ninety nine? Like the idea of Dark Horse is like that's all fun and games, but we need to make some money. We're, we're yeah, sorry here. about yeah, but yeah, we're making money with this. And I'll tell everybody, I'm a big Mark Miller fan. I haven't finished the first volume of Nightclub, no. and a, even Gray ended up sending me a review copy of this early, and I really wanted to. I have three. I I'm halfway through the first volume, uh, but I haven't caught up, so I have to do that. That's why I haven't read this yet. Kind of page through it and it looked pretty cool. It's cool, and of course, it's basically teenage vampire superheroes. You know, imagine if you got vampire powers, would you choose to be a superhero? It's it's a new idea, which I thought was cool. And um, I've seen a bit of criticism of people saying, "Oh, Mark Miller's trying to do a, a Steve Buscemi," you know, "Hey, I'm done with the kids" kind of thing. But I think it re- it reads really well, Jim. I thought the dialogue was great. The teenagers sound like well, I guess teenagers. You know, I don't have a teenager myself anymore, but. It didn't. It didn't sound too dodgy. You it know sounds I mean. like these these two old men think it sounds like what teenagers <laughs> say nowadays. So I'm down with it. But again, I, the the book, the issues that I've read of the first one, I really like. I really yeah. do like it. I just kind of lost track of it and doing all the other things. I hadn't finished it. Uh, and actually, I think Big Game was the thing that stopped me. I was reading it right before. Then I was reading Big Game, and then I just kind of went with that. But uh, yeah, I, I, I've never heard anybody. I, most of the time, Mark Miller gets criticized for being over the top and, and yes. that sort of thing. I, I love his dialogue. I think his dialogue is always really good. Uh, but again, anything else? This isn't too much over the top as well. It's more. It's, I think it's one of his more kind of fun series, but maybe he's getting a bit more serious with his volume two because we've got a bit of kind of a gang war building with uh, the teenage vampires involved in that. What's cool, Jim, is the, there's quite a lot of uh, nods to YouTube because they're they're filming their fights and things. They're putting it up on YouTube, like they're making money. They're monetizing their, you know, their superheroes, but keeping it a secret that the vampires are kind of like, you know, saying, okay, we're just like we are superheroes, but we can't tell people we're vampires because they're all crazy. But what's funny is that the, most people say this is fake. It's, it's all CG. This is nonsense. That they don't believe it's actually real. So that's pretty good. good. That's yeah. pretty good in using that whole and and uh, a lot of times when you use you know Twitter or you it, it kind of gets wonky but I'm glad yeah. to see that it's pretty good but we'll move on to the next book which is also another one of your picks. Oh my God, is it me again? Okay, it's you again. <laughs> it's another dark horse. It's Usagi Ojimbo, the Crow issue five. It wraps up the current story arc. Stan Sakai, of course, writer and artist. Um, not much to say apart from it was a really nice concluding issue jim he wraps up the story really well it doesn't end on a cliffhanger so you get a nice tight like five issue story and i, I recommend it to any fans of kind of japan or samurai or you know just good good animal action yeah and i i actually read the first two issues under your you you suggested it and i i do like Yusagi your jimbo and really if if it comes out it's it's always going to be good Sten Sakai is really really good but i have to read the next couple so i didn't read that as well uh but yeah like you said it's what it is and uh, most people who would know what it is are already reading it and i think it's so yeah good. very loyal fan base isn't it you know not massive it's not a massive fan base and sadly i wish it got a bit more attention but so reliable for 40 years of this that's idea. the thing it's like i remember you know way way back and I like one of the first things that i heard before i even read comics i ended up uh checking out Yusagi Ujimbo. Uh, back in the day so that's pretty cool. cool but now we'll go to image and i'm gonna let you give the uh credits for this but it is a couple books that i've read now i think i've read all the next three books that we have i've read all three of them but you go with the next book okay well, this is a recommendation from jim for weird science comics because i've missed this it's images a uh, new number one called standstill Written by Lee Luffridge. Um, it's got art by Andrew Robinson, even though it says different on the credits. Published by Image, of course, four ninety nine. But Jim, what to say about this? It's a it's a whole issue of double page spreads. It's double isn't page it? spreads. The the funny thing, and Lee Luffridge, as far as I know, is usually a colorist, so it's pretty. Good. That's right. That's and, right. And uh, when I ended up, I got a review copy, and I ended up starting, it and I looked, and I'm like, this is seventy pages. Like, what the heck? And then I was reading it. And when you get the review copies, just to let everybody know, it, it kind of doesn't give you full page spreads automatically, even in a reader that you're reading it. 
So I, I kind of got lost a little, not I realizing yeah, it was first. spread yeah. pages. So I'm Same. like, ah, and I didn't read it then. And then I ended up getting somebody said, did you read it? It's really good. It's all spread pages. I'm like, damn it. Like I went back then and then I actually bought it and actually had the legit, you know, copy. And I'm like, this is good. <laughs> this is crazy because it's a, it's a weird play of a power to stop time. Yeah. And what you would kind of what you would do if you could do that. And the guy who's involved doing this, he does the right thing, but the wrong way. It seems like he ends up really getting some bad people and doing bad things to them, but they're really bad things. And it's not like a superhero type of way that he does this. And then in the middle of it, you kind of get the idea of this guy who may have made this tech that it got commandeered. So there's a lot of things going on. Yeah, that in a first issue are very intriguing. Very intriguing. He's a bit of a he's an antihero, isn't he? Because you're not sure about him at all. This main character, he's a dick. Is What's what he, he called? Is. I mean, the <laughs> rule or something. Yes. Well, he is a prick. <laughs> this a guy. And, but it actually plays out, and it's hilarious. Like at the beginning, it starts out. He goes into a biker bar, and he kind of you know pretends that he's a gay guy going into the biker bar, and just taunts these bikers, and that starts telling them. That everything that they're wearing and stuff is all homosexual looks that they got from Marlon Brando and the wild, the wild one. And they yep. get mad. And then he, you don't realize what's going on at this point. And then you just have suddenly he disappears and the main biker guy has a knife in his hand and everybody's dead. And you don't know what happened. And then as you go, you start to realize exactly what happened yeah there. that was a great and premise it's really really cool it's really that well set up isn't it? it slowly builds up so you're not quite sure why or how he's doing it but when the reveal comes you're like okay cool so what he does is he sets up these situations he stops time and then messes with everybody in, in violent ways and crazy ways so it's, <laughs> it's really cool and then at the very end he's in the middle east and it's almost a play of exactly how it started to getting in the biker bar he's doing that in a middle eastern bar you're like oh my god you're like all these people are dead but you also have the government involved in all this so it's it's, it's really cool i it was is. actually very shocked the big surprise is it kind of came out of nowhere didn't it i didn't yeah. know anything about it i actually kind of checked it out and put it aside because of the format and i didn't get it and i'm so, I'm so glad that i read it because it was one of the biggest surprises i've had in quite some time and one of my favorite books of the week so i i really i really suggest if you haven't checked it out check it out it's really really good and it's kind of cool once you get into it and it's all the full spread pages, you get used to it. And in that, there's a bunch of pages, they're spread, but it, it's not over dialogue. It's a very, very quick read. And yeah, really, it is really surprising because cool. yeah. it's like 64 pages, it says here on the synopsis. Like, it no really way. threw me the idea of, oh my God, this is going to take me so long. And, you know, all this and that. No, it, it is so fast because you, and you get really into it. It's really cool. And it's one of those mysteries. And as it's revealed, it's done in a really good pace in, in that first issue to see. And you still don't know everything about it. Uh, but, you know, obviously, it's the first issue. It really sets up things good. So I, I think that's a great pick. Uh, but I'm going to move on. And this is my pick of the indie. It's Red Coat, Red Coat number five, the Ghost Machine stuff. It's Jeff Johns writing Andrew Curry. Or actually, it's it's Brian Hitch. It always does this. I always get the credits from the uh, comic book roundup and always puts Andrew Curry on that i believe he does either the inks or the colors but it's brian brian hitch on the art i like red coat it is 399 i think it's worth it a lot of people have red coat as their least favorite but still liking it but the least favorite of the ghost machine stuff i actually have it second i think rook exodus is most people's number one and then you kind of you know tussle between red coat and geiger it but keeps i change in jim isn't it i think a lot of people with the, the, the each issue comes out for me, this was a bit disappointing, to be honest. I was a little, little bit bored with this one, but that, that's just me. This one got my worst review score, but it's an eight. So we always talk about the idea of an eight and above makes oh, yeah, it. It's this still a is, good book, for sure. It, this is at the line there, though, and yeah, I, yeah, I hope I it think picks so. up. Because in this, you have a bit of downtime, you have a bit of exposition, and it all goes with the idea that George Washington was the architect of these founding fathers that are after Simon. And he has already been cut by this axe. You have Einstein trying to figure out how he can end up being safe. And they do figure out how. Unfortunately, at that point, Simon gets hit by the axe again, almost like just nicked in the, the thumb or something. In it, but it draws mm. blood. And yeah. so he has, and if you get hit three times, immortality's over. And Einstein's like, I, I think we can get this. And figures out 
that what you have to do is somebody else now. Another immortal has to be stabbed with the axe, and then that kind of clears Simon's deal. So their big plan is to go and get Washington. It's like, you know, two birds with one stone. We'll go and hit Washington. We'll kill him. He's the architect of the Founding Fathers. We'll take care of all this. In the meantime, Simon ends up doing my one of my favorite tropes is also where you tell somebody to get the hell out. Get the hell out. We don't need you. And then when they walk away, the guy's crying. I really <laughs> did need you, but I didn't want you to get hurt because he ends up. He, it's true, though. Einstein's just a kid. And they're going to go fight the founding fathers and immortal George Washington. He thinks you can't have a little kid there. And he doesn't want Einstein to die. So he says, you know, we don't need you. Einstein's yelling in his crazy German accent. But he's saying, you're not going to live till tomorrow if you don't have me. I'm the brain. He's right. Because then you get a twist at the end. I won't reveal the big reveal because it's huge. No. But it's one of those reveals and why I still made it an eight. The reveal ends up being something that is so easy to recognize like but then you're still surprised though you're like oh god like it's not what you actually like i didn't want this to happen in all sorts of ways but i wasn't surprised that it happened so you end up finding out some truths and some lies and things like that by the end but you're right in it though you have a lot of going from here to there oh we got to get tickets to this boat deal and it kind of did you know, drag it's a, a very more. verbose as well. Yeah, There's a it lot of writing a little more this, than any of the other issues yeah. of this. But it's have. still really good. You're, you're right. It's still good. I to, maybe it needs to reread it, Jim. Give it a shot. It, maybe it, it, I'm telling you. I like I said, it just <clears> made it just made an eight. And even when it's funny now that we do this show, and this is on our indie show that I was doing. Again, I might put it up as a video here on the YouTube channel. But in the meantime, when I'm doing things, I do end up thinking like. Is this going to be in the best of? And I, it, that kind of gets like the deal of the score. And I'm like, yeah, I, I think it's an eight. So I, I gave yeah. it and kind of right away. I thought, yeah, I'm talking to Gray about that. But I do suggest if you haven't read any of the Ghost Machine, read them all. Geiger, Redcoat, and Rook Exodus. They're all really, really They're good. three of the best comics coming out right now. Three, three really good series. I yeah. think that the other thing, just as Redcoat, the deal... It seemed to be everybody's like, well, I don't know about this. They didn't know if they like Simon. We kind of like him because he's like a Constantine type character. Mm, mm. Uh, but again, you have to keep hitting because I think this red coat is the one that people aren't as attached to as much as Geiger or Rook Exodus. But I really like it. It is my second favorite. I still like it. I love Geiger, too. And they're very close. One, two and three are very close. But I still like red coat second. But we'll finish up. With a Titan book, I think most people have this on their list as well. I'll pass it over to you to end this. What is it? It's one of the best current series again. It's uh, Conan the Barbarian, issue 14 from Titan, written by Jim Zub. It's got art by Doug Braithwaite, and it also says Diego Rodriguez. Might be the cover, I'm not sure. Three ninety nine. It's just been such a reliable series, and I like the way that with this current story arc, he's gone back in time, hasn't he? He's showing Conan when he was younger, you know, when he's like, he's still he's a man, but he's a young man at this point. And what can be said about the art, Jim? Not just the, the it's, characters, it's really but good. the landscapes are stunning in this. Yeah. The world. Oh, yeah. And it, it really, Doug Braithwaite's doing a really good job. I still like De La Torre's art overall. Me too. Uh, but this yeah. is really good. And it's really Beautiful. cool because you, you get to see the Vikings and Conan yes. hanging with them. And they're very impressed by him. And there, there is a funny play where they're talking about some of the stereotypes and some stories they've heard. Uh, about you know conan and his people like hey something you know i won't say fully but they like to do things with rocks and they they kind of like make fun of conan and he kind of throws it back at him <laughs> it's pretty funny and good all pacing, of it's pretty good good yeah, dialogue yeah, like good it. action when it comes in like i say it's funny at times like you say so yeah it's just it's a great all-round comic book but some people don't like this kind of style if you don't like conan that, that setting maybe, maybe you don't enjoy it but i think that's quite rare. Yeah, and then you also have a fr- kind of like a frost giant lady, like th- this whole deal going on. I thought it was going to be Red Sonia. But I did. I made a it. mistake. I got told off on YouTube. <laughs> Actually, it's the frost giant's daughter. And that's, again, I ended up when I'm reading it, and I'm like, oh. and the funny thing is, at first, oh, I hope it's Red Oh, no, no, it's frost giant starter. And then I went and looked, and I'm like, oh, gray. You've done my stuff. <laughs> you hey, giggle, it's but over. Still, that's what happens. But uh, <laughs> it's really good. It is really good. And I ended up getting in a fight with my man Eric on our DC Comics podcast a bit because he's really enjoying the uh, Dark Knights of Steel all winter. Okay. And because and he's like, I like Viking stories. I'm like, 
you should read this week's Conan. Like, it's so much better. And he's like, I'm not going to read that. It's not DC. I'm like, well, it's your loss because Conan He won't is... read Conan. He won't read Transformers. What's it all about, no, dude? What's going on? he won't read anything but DC. It seems like he's, like, stuck in that. Even though growing up, he was a Marvel kid and all these things. But oh, Okay. I didn't know that. Now, I, if I could get him on these different podcasts, maybe he'd open up and, and read some. Th- he only reads what he asked to because he's lazy is what he is. He'll never listen to this, too, so I can badmouth him. But, uh. Conan's really good and will probably be a lot of people's picks for book of the year by the end of the year. It'll at least be on a ton of lists with people who are in the know. I see some of those other lists where they had like list uh, halfway, you know, midterm deal. The things they were picking, I don't know what these people are reading and what they think. But Conan definitely uh, is just as good as the Ghost Machine stuff, as is the Energon stuff. So if you are out there saying comics stink and this is the worst. There are comics that just happens to be a lot of indie stuff a right lot now. Of indie, yeah. yeah, a yeah. lot of indie stuff and a lot of stuff that is more so than in the past kind of getting their own universes and connected stuff going, which was something that I don't think indie stuff did before because it didn't have the popularity and it was hard to get that going, but it's definitely going now. So I'm telling you, Jim, really DC like and Marvel could both like, you know, get, get a good lesson by looking to the indies at the moment, see what they're doing, you know? Yeah, really. I mean, they, they really are doing great stuff. And, you know, Jeff Johns, who obviously did work at DC, still does. He said that, that damn JSA book's never going to end. I mean, they even, uh, that book is delayed so much <laughs> that Jeff Lemire, who's taking over the JSA, has already had to announce listen, if my book is coming out and there's, I'm still, it's still coming out. We're not waiting for the end of this Jeff Johns deal. We're just coming out. So that was crazy because who knows when that's going to end. But he's killing it uh, over at the Ghost Machine stuff and, and writing three books. So and, and with that, he also has some fill-in artists that are coming in, which is a good idea. The Gary Frank, he kind of falls behind at points and Geiger's going to have Paul Pelletier. Yeah, Brian Hitch, yeah, he's, yeah, he sometimes will struggle because the art is so good, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. The art is great. Every yep. month. Yeah, it is. And Jason Fawbuck's art on Rook Exodus is so Oh, my cool. gosh. So, Amazing. But that's it. That is it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, some of these books end up being the usual suspects because they have been so good. Conan has pretty much been on our list every week. And uh, also all of the – I don't think that we've missed one of the Ghost Machine books yet in no. our list there. I had to point it out this week because Gray's sus. But that's the, the problem. <laughs> but you picked a bunch of other things. And, again, I would stress to everybody – uh, check out that standstill if you haven't. It's, it's really, really good. But that's that. That is it for this week. We went a little longer because we had a longer list. But I don't mind that if we have good comics. That is always pretty cool. But thanks, everybody. Thanks, Greg, for joining me. And again, Cheers, he, mentioned, he mentioned his Conan deal. Go over to his uh, Wakazashi's Tea House. That is the deal. They'll be in the show notes and give them crap. Give him crap for Red Sonia. That's what I say. <laughs> and that's the thing. You know, you, you uh, say that. I always yell because everybody's always yelling at me, but it's still a view and it's still somebody uh, engaging. So I try to win them over. I never do, but I try. But that's it for uh, that. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Let us know what your books are in the comments, and we will talk to you later. You are all weirdos. Weird science is the revolution. Weird science is the revolution.